Welcome back to the Hawkeye. It's time for the game recap. The Redskins faced off against the Ravens in preseason week three, and despite the ejection of cornerback Chris Culliver for fighting and some early offensive struggles, came out victorious with a final score of 31 to 13. But don't let the score fool you. Things are as murky as ever here in Washington. The Washington Post's Mark Bullock is with us today to give us his thoughts on the game, so don't you go away. It's all coming up next right here on the Hawks Die. Done. <laughs> It's the Hogs Die. Do we? All right, welcome back. It's your number one unofficial source for all things Redskins and the NFL. Coming at you today with another exclusive interview. My name's Sean Conti. I'm joined today by Robbie Duncan. What's up, everybody? Alex Zies. Hey, everybody. How's it going? And Steve Thomas. Hello, all, and welcome back to another episode. Guys, uh, 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 please join me in welcoming our next guest. He's from the UK, but moved to the Northern Virginia area around the age of five. He left the States a few years later, but not without garnering a love and appreciation for the sport of American football. So, after studying the game as an adult and accumulating a wealth of knowledge, he's landed jobs at SB Nation, Hogs Haven, Baltimore Sports and Life, and the Washington Post, as well as running his own independent football blog. So, we are absolutely honored and humbled to welcome to the Hog side today, the Washington Post Insider's very own Mark Bullock. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Round of applause. Yes. We're not worthy. <laughs> We're not worthy. Ah, uh, you're too kind. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, uh, would you could you tell us maybe a little bit about how you end up doing what you do? How'd you become a uh, American football analyst? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you pretty much summed up pretty well there. Um, when I'm, my family moved out to the states when I was younger, um, around when I was five, and uh, basically picked up. Uh, a couple of the American sports, like baseball, like ice hockey, basketball, and of course American football, um, or just football for you guys, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we moved back, I kind of went off of the sports a little bit um, until probably five or six years ago now. Um, and then I caught a couple of NFL games on TV over here and got back into it and then thought, you know what, might as well support the Redskins as I was lived out in D.C., go with the most local team I know, uh, and then it kind of just built from there, really. Awesome. Not sure if We're that so was a sorry wise decision you... or a good decision. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was asking. <laughs> well, Mark, this is Steve uh, Thomas here. Um, it, yeah, your level of knowledge and your ability to break down game film is just tremendous. You have you know, almost awesome. a coach's level of knowledge about this. You never played the game. You've, you've watched, you, you picked it up as you just said through watching some games on TV. How did you develop your expertise? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, you're being very generous there. I, I'm still learning the game every day. Really, um, it's it's all it's come from is a, a genuine interest in it and watching as much as I can mm-hmm. um, to a pretty much a nerd extent of watching um, <laughs> the, every play back as many times. Going, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why is he going there? What does that do? Sort of thing. Um, and then just reading as much as I can from the following the right people on Twitter and fo- reading the the most interesting articles to me and just trying to soak it all up, really. Mm-hmm. Mark, it's Robbie from uh, the Insider's Post, uh, known as Dead Eye Duncan. Uh, hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, man? Uh, yeah, pretty let's good. Go in, let's go into last night's game. A lot of stuff to go off of. Obviously, we gotta <laughs> we got to start with Kirk Cousins. Let me. A lot of people, if you haven't already, he put up a really great post about how well Kirk Cousins did, how he managed the game, looked yeah. calm in the pocket. Uh, can you touch on that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, it, the, Kirk, Kirk Cousins has most Redskins fans like completely split on opinion. I think mm-hmm. most people fall into two categories where they're either hardcore Griffin fans or they're we just want the best guy. That, that can help the team win out there playing. And right. yeah. the hardcore Griffin fans are the ones that today are watching back every single play going, well, he, he missed the throw here or <laughs> he made a little mistake there. Uh, whereas the rest of us are going, well, you know, he's, he's kind of played better than Griffin has. And in that one game against the Ravens, we saw more sort of quarterbacking technique mm-hmm. in the pocket than we've seen from Griffin for the past two years, really. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious for most people to see that he, he played really well. He, he showed good poise in the pocket, 
Um, um, the interception was a bad play. That that was on him. He probably should have thrown that one away. Um, yeah. But mm-hmm. the the good thing was that we got to see from him, which was something that he struggled with mainly in the past, was he, he doesn't bounce back well from negative plays like interceptions, fumbles, turnovers. Um, but we got to see him get rid of the uh, interception, get that out of his mind, and then move on and still put in a good performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to actually, I, I think we wanted to ask you about the interception too, but um, first, I mean, I just noticed from your article this morning, you had some really great examples um, of Kirk Cousins reading defenses and making adjustments. So specifically, you mentioned that touchdown pass where he reads the blitz and slides the line to give himself a throwing lane. And then there was that earlier yep. first down to Jordan Reed where he had to read read the outside corner after the snap to, to make a decision on the throw. So I guess my question is, how is Griffin at playing like that? I mean, it, I, we know he, he can kind of do the read option plays, but how is he really at reading defenses in, you know, in comparison to Kirk Cousins? Uh, Cousins is far more advanced at it. Uh, Cousins has always been far more, far more advanced at it because of the yeah. system he comes from in college. He, he's been doing those kind of reads in college for, mm-hmm. sin, for, since he was in college and since he's come through to the NFL, whereas mm-hmm. Griffin in college was doing the read option attack he famously didn't have a playbook and all of this kind of stuff in college um and they've slowly built him up and they were i think he was on the right path when in his rookie year with the shanahans in learning more and more about doing the more pro style reads but at this point he he's regressed since that first year and yeah he can still if if he has plenty of time like a perfectly clean pocket and he has clear vision of the receiver and knows exactly what the um, the design of the play is, then he, he can make those reads as well. But Cousins is far more um, apt at making the correct reads and making them quickly and getting the ball out of hands to the correct receiver on time. So, so in thing, other words, he's almost a better improviser. Uh, well, almost. Um, in case, in it's more of he he's better when when there's pressure on him to with with if everything's perfect that's when Griffin can make those kind of reads whereas Cousins if everything's not amazing that he doesn't have the perfect pocket if he has to make a subtle movement um, to avoid pressure from from his right or whatever um, he can make that and still keep his eyes downfield make the read and get the ball out of his hand quickly whereas Griffin as soon as he feels that pressure. He'll start backing away. He'll he'll look to um, scramble, or if he's not 100 percent sure on, oh that corner is not quite dropping back, but he's not quite coming forward. He gets indecisive and he, he doesn't get the ball, rid of the ball quickly enough, and that draws in pressure yeah. and sacks. Yeah, th- speaking of sacks, I mean, you look at last night with both Kurt and Colt. I mean, no sacks at all happened last night. Sure, there was yeah. a couple times where it got close. But Kirk did a great job of getting the ball out of his hands really quick before they could get to him. Uh, I believe Morgan Moses had at least two that he uh, just kind of leaned on his guy and didn't really, you know, punch him. You know, just kind of lunged on him and tried to run him upfield. Yep. But but guys like Elvis Doomerville and Terrell Suggs, they're very great at running that loop. And you got to kind of punch him and knock him off track. But the point is, I mean, you can't. You got to look at the stats and say, hey. You know, look at the number of quarterback hits and sacks from last night compared to, oh, you know, all the yeah. games Roberts played before. It's it the stats back that up. You know, yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. Griffin, he he just he holds onto the ball for too long, waiting for receivers to run open rather mm-hmm. than Cousins anticipates the receivers running open. And from time to time, that will lead to interceptions when something happens that he's not anticipating properly, but. It's it's almost worth more putting up with a couple more interceptions, but him getting the ball out of his hands and moving the offense and not taking sacks yeah. than I'm with Griffin that. Griffin taking more and more sacks. Let me let me touch on this with you, Mark. Um, Colt McCoy, I thought last night looked like the Colt McCoy against Dallas last year. I mean, yes, it was against the Scrubs, you know, the third stringers and less. Yeah, but he looked you know, extremely confident and cool and under pressure like Kirk did. Uh, they both of them have been very successful this preseason. Any, any touch, can you touch on Colt McCoy at all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, McCoy definitely looked, um, more poised than say Griffin would in the pocket. He, he, yeah. he kind of, people are saying he's kind of an in-between of 
Cousins and Griffin. Uh, and yep. in a way, he kind of is. He he has the kind of scrambling improvisation that you expect from Griffin. Um, but he's also poised in the pocket like Cousins is. I don't think right. he's quite as well developed as Cousins is in the pocket at, at just standing there making the reads, making one or two subtle um, movements to avoid pressure and getting rid of the ball. I think McCoy is a little bit more prone to feeling a pressure, feeling the pass rush and trying to scramble. And to his credit, he's done a pretty good job of scrambling and avoiding pressure and keeping plays alive. Um, yeah. I mean, famously, that Dallas play, um, that play passed to Jordan Reed against Dallas, I think it was. Was that mm-hmm. an overtime? Um, yeah. I mean, that that was an incredible play. So mm-hmm. you, you can't kill him for that. But you, you just feel that um, there are times when Cousins will just make the subtle step and avoid the pressure and get the ball out quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark, if, if uh, you were the head coach and salaries and draft uh, status aside... Which one of these three guys would you start? I, I I think for me the decision seems to be obvious. You you go with Kirk Cousins um, regardless yeah. of all the draft stuff and the, the the names and what have you. Cousins is the guy that gives you the best chance to win. He operates the offense um, the way Drake Dr- Jay Gruden has it designed. Um, he just gives you the best chance to win. Okay, uh, Mark Hayes, <coughs> Alex. Um, I got a question for you regarding the whole Jordan Reed situation. Uh, We finally saw him in some action last night. Uh, Just can you kind of go through what he brings to the table in terms of uh, opening up the passing game, especially if Cousins is in there? I feel like having that good tight end is going to be really valuable. Can you go into that a little? Yeah, well, the the good thing about Jordan Reed is that he's basically another receiver, but he plays tight end. Um, So... Gruden, particularly last year, loved splitting out the tight end mm-hmm. um, with uh, his three receiver set, and he'd have the re- tight end on his own on one side of the field, and he would basically run him. Uh, if, if the defense matched him up with a linebacker, he'd run an ISO out to Jordan Reed, and Jordan Reed would win it every single time, yeah. um, because he's just a, too good of a receiver for linebackers and safeties to cover. Um, and similarly, if it's a corner, you throw a jump ball, and Jordan Reed's going to go and catch it over the top of any corner. So yep. um, it's, it's it gives defenses a lot to think about. His ability not only to beat linebackers and get open, but after the catch as well mm-hmm. to pick up extra yards. It, it's phenomenal. It, he, I, I've genuine. I've said it before. I genuinely believe if he can stay healthy, he can be one of the top five, if not top three, receiving tight ends in the league. But yeah, obviously I, I, the big question is yeah. him staying healthy. Yeah. I even yeah. tweeted last night during the game, uh, you know, Jordan Reed, just stay healthy, damn it, because yeah, he's exactly. special, man. He is very special. Um, I also kind of wanted to touch on what some people, at least friends that I know and other Redskins fans that I've talked to, uh, want to make this a controversy too. What do you think about uh, Alfred Morris and Matt Jones? Because, uh, I mean, a lot of last night I don't put on Alfred's fault. I thought the running, the O-line was not run blocking very well, especially Morgan Moses. No, he but, was uh, running into walls. Yeah, but uh, and it all, just, all of a sudden when Matt Jones comes in, he starts squeaking off some big runs. Do you think that's just coincidence or, or what? Uh, I think in terms of the, they, they run different schemes, I think. Uh, with, yeah. with Morris, he's a zone runner. And mm-hmm. when you run the zone scheme, you run the outside stretch. Morris is as good as, as you can ask for with that type of scheme. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows his reads. He makes them quickly. He makes his cut, and he's decisive. He gets upfield, and that's exactly mm-hmm. what you want. Jones, I haven't, I'm still not convinced I, uh, that he's a good zone running back right. um, strictly for the outside zone. Inside mm-hmm. zone, he can run. You can run the counters and stuff. That's fine. We've seen that. It's the stretch game which they've relied on pretty heavily. And Bill Callahan still is a pretty good fan of the um, of the stretch game. I've still yet to see from Jones that he can run that and make the correct read and be patient with the run. Um, and I've seen the same kind of from Trey Williams as well, where they both have a little tendency to go to to kind of get to the edge and then instantly cut back rather than make the correct read of do I stay with the path I'm on 
do I cut back in the mm-hmm. first hole or do I cut back the second hole? They just instantly cut back and it kind of defeats the purpose of the zone game. Um, in terms of when what Morris was running last night was mostly inside zone or gap uh, blocking plays and mm-hmm. those suit Matt Jones a lot more. They're in, in, the ta- in between the tackle, you'd think Morris should, uh, in theory, be good at that because he's a powerful back, he can break tackles and such. But I don't mm-hmm. think Morris is quite so good at finding his own hole. I think he needs kind of it all drawn out for him like the zone scene gives him. Whereas Jones uh, likes to dance around, find the hole, and then burst through it, which is why we saw, I think, um, why we saw him... him provide kind of a spark for the offense last night yeah yeah i mean and for what it's worth clinton port i asked clinton portis this on twitter the other day and he said uh you know that that uh jones needs some seasoning before he's you know going to be ready to challenge morris for the top spot for whatever that's worth but my question to you um i, I think the data will will uh will demonstrate this i don't have it in front of me certainly the fans i think the the, the common perception of the fans is that uh, Alfred Morris has run a lot better with Robert Griffin under the under center than with another quarterback. It seems like that may be true. Do you think that is true? And if so, why? Yeah, I mean the the stats do show it, and it, it's one hundred percent true. He has run statistically better with um, Griffin under center than any other quarterback. Um, the theory behind it is that Griffin, because of his mobility and his his well known speed. Uh, takes the backside edge defender out of the play, um, mm-hmm. be it through the read option or on bootlegs. Um, the backside edge defender has to account for Griffin rather than just charging down the line and getting Morris. Um, and a lot of the time you do see that. At times you do also see them just completely ignoring Griffin and Morris can still pick up good yards just because the front side of the play is blocked better. Um but certainly with Griffin, Griffin's running ability and Griffin's running threat, he, he definitely does um, improve the... He takes away a backside defender for the, for the run game. Yeah. You know, I have a question for you about... I know we want to ask you about defensive stuff and special team stuff too, but I have a question uh, sure. for you about the offense in general. So, uh, yep. you know, I think even people who are longtime Griffin supporters, it, I think it's getting harder for them to deny what you said, which is that Kirk Cousins, you know, seems to be running the offense better. But, look, the fact of the matter is the first quarter there when the Ravens... did well in that first quarter. Um, he just didn't have any support from the run game. Yeah, uh, I mean, he did. He threw the ball twenty-seven times in the first half, and mm-hmm. he will rarely throw the ball twenty-seven times in three quarters, let alone in the first half. Wow. So, yeah. Um, but yes, um, they should definitely temper expectations uh, when it comes to starters. I mean, first first two weeks they faced two very strong defensive lines, so yeah. particularly that right side of the offensive line with Sheriff and Moses. They, mm-hmm. they're probably going to take their knocks. They're probably going to struggle. Um, and they, they're really going to rely on the likes of Trent Williams and Corey Lichtensteiger to really um, give them some better experience and help them get through it. Um, I, I, I can see them struggling a lot with the Rams because the Rams' defensive line, in my eyes, is the strongest in the NFL. Um, so I, I can see them really struggling in both the running game and pass protection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we're going to need to have a, a lead with them because their, their yeah, pass rush is going to be scary. It really is. Um, with with the Dolphins, they they have two or three pieces there which are very good. Um, obviously, big names than Sue and Cameron Wake. Um, those those guys are a little bit more well known for their pass rush, so their potential you can you can run on them a little bit better. Um, mm-hmm. With with the zone scheme, you you can get away with running the zone the outside zone game mm-hmm. against more aggressive defenses like the Rams and and the Dolphins with with three techniques like Aaron Donald and um yeah. Sue because they they can play aggressive and you can kind of trap them inside get them washed inside and run the outside zone you can get away with that but um the Rams have defensive ends that will just set an edge and the Redskins don't really have a blocking tight end right now that can help set that edge um then they they they're, they're going to struggle well, yeah, I was going to flip it to the defense, but bringing up the blocking tight end, uh, Tom Compton's been getting a lot of reps with the ones yep. as a blocking style tight end. Do you think they're going to really just 
kind of go with that even in the regular season, or is this just something they're experimenting with? Uh, it, to an extent, it's something they're exper- experimenting with. They they tried it, tried it last year as well. They when they would go kind of goal line personnel. Um, yeah. They, they they bring him in as the third tight end. Um, like an unbalanced type thing. Yeah, they, they would unbalance the line sometimes. Um, and, and to be fair to him, I think he's done pretty pretty well um, as a blocking tight end, as you, you kind of yeah. expect a, a tackle to be able to. Um, but I, I do think certainly one tight end the Redskins it, it, the Redskins will have on their final roster isn't currently on their roster. There's going to be wow. hundreds of cuts over the next yeah. week or two, yeah. and I think they'll find someone that can come in and block for them. Probably, you know, Reed, Carrier, and then whoever this third guy is going to be, right? Yeah, yeah, I would have thought so. Okay, so let's let's flip over to the other side of the ball, uh, defense. Um, here's a position that's looking to be more of a battle than you know than I anticipated it to be. Um, with Junior Gallette out, you know, we're back to square one with Preston Smith and Trent Murphy. Yep. Um, I'm I'm of the opinion, Mark, that. Preston Smith has been outperforming Trent Murphy. Am I wrong in saying that? Because Murph, I mean, Preston Smith's kind of been flashing a lot. Murphy has kind of been <laughs> not even out there. It seems not flashing. Times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not necessarily wrong. Uh, Preston Smith has been flashing. Um, I think they've been asked to do different things. Um, I think you and I had a discussion on Twitter earlier. They, they've been asking Trent Murphy to do a lot more of dropping into coverage. Um, moving around the fields, um, mm-hmm. yeah. whereas Preston, Preston Smith's been asked to go get the quarterback. And obviously, and from a pass rushing point of view, you want Preston Smith to go get the quarterback. You want Trent Murphy to go get the quarterback. Um, yeah. But I think the the way the defense is being set up right now, I think one of the outside linebackers is going to have to be dropping into coverage more often. And mm. they they've just paid Ryan Kerrigan a ton of money to go get the quarterback, so I don't think he's going to be the one that they're going to ask to drop into coverage, which well, makes me think they're shading towards Trent Murphy because they're getting him to drop into coverage more. Mm-hmm. Uh, when th- speaking about that, about the conversation we were having, uh, you pointed out too, uh, we both kind of noticed this, Trent Murphy was lining up as like a weak side linebacker in a 4-3. They brought Chris Baker in as that second D tackle, and Hatcher and Preston Smith were the DNs. Yep. You, you think they're yep. going to be running a little bit of 4-3 like that too? Yeah, that was um, it. Was a thought I had uh, on a post last week, um, where losing Gillette is obviously a big loss. But in the cover three defense that they they seem to be wanting to run, they only have four pass rushes anyway, and one of the outside linebackers is going to have to drop into coverage. So one way around it is if you say, right, Kerrigan, you're basically going to be a four three defensive end. You go rush. Let's move. Um, let's use our defensive line depth that we now have. We'll move someone like Stephen Pyre or Jason Hatcher, and it was Hatcher in this case. We'll kick mm-hmm. him to defensive end on the other side. And we'll use our strong defensive line depth to fill the two other defensive tackle roles in the middle. And then we'll kick Trent Murphy or Preston Smith um, to kind of a three, four, uh, a four-three linebacker and have him mm-hmm. drop into coverage. And that's that seems to be what they they want to be doing. I kind of like it to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I, it's, I think it's intriguing. It's definitely intriguing. It's, it's definitely a thing that they can play around with a little bit. Um, they've, they've definitely got a lot of options when it comes to that, um, which is why I don't think the Gallette injury is as big a loss as it could have been, um, mm. especially as we hadn't actually seen him play in a Redskins uniform yet. Um, so yeah. uh, this, this was originally the plan, was to let Murphy and um, Preston Smith battle it out and see whoever was the best player. They get, they get the time. Um, so I, I don't see a problem with it, um, and I, I think kicking Hatcher or Pyre out to defensive end on one side and having Kerrigan rush from the other, I think I think that can be productive. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this is all awesome and re- related to a, a really cool article you wrote a few days ago about the cover three defense and this shift you're seeing to the cover three three four base defense. And we know that um, that Hazlitt also ran a 3-4, but maybe if you could just speak a little bit more to this shift uh, uh, to the base scheme under Barry, I think that would be really cool. Yeah, um, to me, it seems to be... Uh, I'm not sure whether it is a Scott McLuhan influence or whether they've just gone, well, Seattle's the best defense in the league, what are they doing well? Um, or if it's just a completely fresh idea from Joe Barry. But it does seem to be that they're 
taking the base scheme from Seattle, which was the cover three scheme. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the essential um, essentials of the cover three scheme is that you have four pass rushes, four underneath the zone coverage and three deep zone coverage. And it it gives you safe protection with seven guys in zone coverages. Um, It gives you three guys deep to cover against deep shots. And it asks your four best pass rushers to go get the quarterback and force underneath throws for the year seven zone defenders to then rally to the ball, make the tackle, keep it to a minimal gain. Um, in theory, that works really well, and it has worked really well for the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. Um, but the two keys for it are uh, the front four getting pass rush, which has been somewhat indifferent so far this preseason. Uh, they yeah. flashed at times, but they haven't at others. Um, and then the other key is being able to make the tackles and keep them to minimal gains, yeah. which, as we saw last night with the first team defense, isn't happening yet. No, yeah. no it was not. Yeah. Well, my, I have a question that kind of follows up on the uh, defensive backs in this whole situation. Uh, and it kind of goes back to what we saw with Hazlitt for years, that the defensive backs are constantly playing way off the line of scrimmage. And one thing I also th- see when I would watch Seattle play is you would always see the backs be physical at the line of scrimmage and then drop back into whatever their coverage is. Um, and yep. I'm just wondering if you could... You know, we're not seeing that, and I'm wondering why. Like, it seems like that physicality is also important for disrupting the timing of the whole, uh, de- uh, the whole, the whole offense. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a variation Seattle have on the cover three scheme is that they have their corners essentially playing man coverage for the first few steps of the play, and they they play press man coverage where they they go and they try to jam the receiver at the line of scrimmage and they read his release. And if the guy takes a certain release, then they're essentially in man coverage. The two outside corners play man coverage on those corners, Mm -hmm. uh, on those receivers, while the other defenders play exactly as if it's cover three. Um, But if the receivers take a different type of release, then after a a jam at the line of scrimmage, they'll slowly drop back, and then it will just be your kind of standard cover three. The Redskins haven't shown that yet. Um, I think... The reason for that is that the, how badly the defense played last year where nobody was on the same page and there was just coverages being blown all over the place. I think they're trying to, their best to keep it as simple as possible so that yeah. everyone knows the scheme as as thoroughly as possible before they start adding things like that kind of variation to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark, it's Steve. I'd like to ask you about D'Angelo Hall a little bit. Um, it looked like sure. once he, he moved to the outside last night, I, I thought he played pretty well. He had the one pass, de- uh, the, the one pat, uh, pass defense there w- on the sideline pattern. Uh, looked like he hung with the, the receiver pretty well, got his hand up in the, in the middle yeah. of uh, the receiver's field division there and knocked yep. the ball away. Um, you know, obviously the, the big question on him is whether his Achilles is going to heal 100% and whether he's going to get his uh, speed and athleticism back. I'm wondering, and, and you know, none of us know the answer to that, I'm wondering what you've seen of him in the preseason thus far and whether or not he's going to be able to remain our number one corner. Well, he, he, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he hasn't played a hell of a lot of snaps in preseason. I think they've held him out a fair bit. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Um, they definitely have. Yeah, um, so it, it's hard to get a complete judge on exactly where he is with regards to that injury. Um, you'd, you'd imagine they're, they're playing it uh, cautiously, um, holding him out and trying not to overwork him. Um, but he, he was coming off a season, granted he got injured very early in the season, but early on he had struggled um, a couple times with, with deep, particularly deeper coverages. Um, staying with the receiver, not necessarily for speed, but he he was getting beaten on things like double moves where he'd be too aggressive, try to jump the route, and then get beaten over the top. Um, so for me, it will be interesting to see how he bounces back. Obviously, the health is an important thing. He's always going to be a, a fast guy as long as he's healthy, um, so he should be able to recover in, that, in, in terms of um, physicality. But I'll be, I'll be interested to see how disciplined he can be in this defense. And with the lack of snaps, I can't really say so far whether he he can be disciplined enough um, or or whether he'll go back to kind of 
the hall we've seen before where he, he tries to jump routes and gets beaten on double moves and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Here, here's a question for you, Mark. Um, mm-hmm. I saw we, a couple of us met, saw you and uh, Manny Benton going back and forth about pot roast. Uh, yeah. He's been he has been a bit underwhelming so far, wouldn't you say? Maybe yeah, that one, yeah, no. one gap scheme isn't very good for him. <laughs> yeah, he's um. There's a couple of different things I've heard from some Denver fans that have tweeted me back from that, saying that he he's always been a guy that he shows up completely overweight, and then in the preseason he plays himself into shape, and like after the first few games he finally gets himself into shape and he gets going. So I'll be keeping an eye out for that. So you think he's sandbagging? Potentially, yeah. Um, a very but, large sandbag. Yeah. yeah from what from what I've seen so far, playing him in the one gap scheme, a guy that size is more suited to a two gap scheme where he can sit over the nose tackle control the block and and read the play and then adjust as the play goes in the one gap scheme he's given an a gap either side of the center which is assigned pre snap um, yeah. and when when the balls run in his direction, so he gets the front side A gap, he can blow up a play because he's just simply too big for a center to block. But when the ball goes away from him, and this is the uh, that's the thing I was tweeting about, um, and I, I tweeted a, piece, a couple of pictures earlier. Um, when the ball goes away from him, he's in the backside A gap. He gets cut block, uh, cut blocked, and then he he just can't. He doesn't have the ability to recover and go pursue the run on the other direction and then that that leaves um a big hole a big cutback lane um yeah for running backs to come into uh which is what we saw last night and what we've seen in preseason when he gets cut he he just leaves a big hole for running backs to cut into okay uh so about this one gap thing too you know chris baker seems to be benefiting from it when he gets his reps at nose he's kind of been causing some disruption there he he got in the backfield a couple times after he yeah. came in for pot roast and yeah he, de- he definitely not saying, has yeah not saying that maybe chris baker should take over or anything but it, it definitely seems that they've found a way to be- really utilize chris baker better yeah absolutely and i, th- I think a one gap scheme we've been pro- probably saying it for a while has it would benefit more of the defenders um everyone since we've changed mm-hmm. from the three uh, from the four three to the three four Everyone's been like, "Why have we changed? We don't have the personnel for it." Um, and switching to a one-gap scheme, it almost puts us back in the same kind of situation as a four-three scheme. Um, okay. And it just—it seems to suit the players that we have, the personnel that we have, a lot better. Um, Terence Knighton is kind of one of maybe maybe one or two guys that that would be better suited to two-gapping. Um, yeah. But but everyone else. Um, particularly, as you said, Baker, Hatcher, Stephen Pyer, the off-season addition, um, mm. th- they're all much more comfortable, much more at home, one-gapping and, and getting upfield. And I think, I think it was Joe Barry said, um, stopping the run on the way to sacking the quarterback, which I think is a great way to put mm-hmm. one-gapping schemes. Mm. All right, well, we got two more things for you before we close out here. Uh, sure. Kind of want to just open it up to you. If there's anything last night that you noticed that we haven't really talked about that you'd like to highlight, uh, you know, anything at all that that caught your eye or from rewatching it again, anybody that kind of stood out for you, go ahead. Uh, well, the obvious guys we've covered. Um, there was a couple little plays where you see things like um, Chris Thompson's pass protection goes completely unnoticed. Um, mm-hmm. you, you don't tend to notice if a running back pass protects well, but yeah. it. He's kind of blown me away, really, this preseason of how well he's he's been um, pass protecting. And considering he's, how small he is, too. It, yeah. yeah, exactly. He it's it's really kind of mind blowing when you see a guy his size take on um, guys like he took on Elvis, Elvis Doomville yesterday, um, yeah. and he did an outstanding job of they they lined up Doomville and Suggs on the same side and they blitzed them and they ran a stunt and. Trent took Suggs on the outside, and Dumerville came right up the B gap, and Chris Thompson read the play perfectly. Um, didn't lunge at Dumerville. He uh, he waited for it to and read the play as it unfolded, and then attacked the block rather than um, necessarily 
straight away lunging at the guy. He attacked the block, but stayed patient, um, held the position, and then um, held his own against Doomerville, and then mm -hmm. help, got help from uh, Sean Laval when he came over from the left guard. And it, it's it's really, for me, it, it makes him, as long as he can stay healthy, which is another big if for Chris Thompson, yeah. um, but as long as he can, it makes him a lock for the third down back spot in my, in my book. Yeah, I agree. Um, awesome. Um, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the show, Mark. We have a quick lightning round to give you, if you wouldn't mind. It's very short. We're going to ask you a sure. series of yes or no questions. So if you're ready, Absolutely. we'll jump right into it. Go for it. Awesome. Okay, so here we go. Lightning round. Will Robert Griffin be the starter week one of 2016? No. Will Gruden be the coach in 2016? No. Ooh. Mm. Will any Redskin not named Trent Williams make the Pro Bowl this year? Yes. All right. Is Alfred Morris going to have another plus 1,000-yard season? Uh, yes. Will Alfred Morris have a least there. a 1,200-yard season? No. <laughs> All right. Will the Redskins be 500 or better this year? No. <laughs> that one was definitive. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was waiting for that one. <laughs> yeah. Last but not least, is the hog side the greatest source for all things Redskins in the NFL? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> there we go. That's, yeah, yeah, that's right. the answer we wanted. Beautiful. We, all right. We well, thank you so much, Mark. No to save your job at yeah. the Washington Post, but <laughs> yeah, we understand. We can take it. Keith. Uh, only like 30 people listen to us. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Give Mark a follow on Twitter. You won't regret it. It's at Mark Bullock NFL. And make sure you're following us, too, at The Hogs Die. And we will see you next for our game recap episode. But, Mark, seriously, thank you so much. And we really hope to have you back. Yeah, of course. Mark, anytime. Yeah, Mark, it was very Thanks, nice guys. to finally talk to you and know what you actually sound like. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thanks very much, yeah. Mark, for uh, coming on with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was good fun. All right. We'll see you next time. Take care. Okay, so that was pretty fucking awesome, guys. I thought that was a great interview, really informative. I wanted to get your um, you know, quick concluding thoughts on it. I mean, top of, top of list for me is he did not shy away from saying Cousins ran this offense better. Um, no. He said a lot of really cool stuff about strategy, but that is the thing that stuck out to me. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see when the season starts, you know, what happens to quarterback as it always is here. Mm -hmm. Steve, what about you? Would you would you pick up from the interview? Yeah, you know, it, it is hard to uh, to argue with him about the Cousins versus Griffin debate, and and no, you know, the ones on ones didn't look good, uh, you know, against the Ravens, but you know, it's it is inarguable that the offense seems to run smoother whether they score points or not with Kirk Cousins at the helm. You know, my question, of course, is you know the long term potential. I think is with Griffin, and you know, so the balance is do you, do you balance? Did you sacrifice this year to hopefully get better at the back end? You know, that's that. And the other thing is uh, he seemed to almost prefer more uh, um, Jones over Morris in some regards in the run yeah. game, mm -hmm. you know, which surprised me a little bit, um, you know, because I think, you know, you have Morris as a proven talent. Jones isn't a proven anything yet. To, to me, it's not nearly uh, quite as – quite as pronounced as maybe Mark let it as, as Mark believes. That's my opinion. Um, defensively, um, yet again, I was unimpressed with the defensive front three, particularly, you know, the, the uh, Ravens ran down the field, you know, on us scored and granted it was, you know, the long bust on the pass play, but the, the three of those guys, Paya, Knight and Hatcher still haven't done much in my view. So the, the, I guess those are my takeaways. Cool. Alex, what about you? Um, well, you know, first, I, I would just say my first takeaway is that was a great interview. And, you know, I'm glad we got Mark on. I'll hope we can get him back, uh, you know, oh, sooner definitely. rather than later. Um, yeah. As far as the game, uh, you know, I wasn't as impressed as some people seem to be with Cousins. I guess he did OK. Uh, frankly, if RG3 put in that kind of performance, I think you'd see a lot more criticism than you're seeing of Cousins right now. Uh, yeah, you know, probably true. Um, I was really impressed by uh, the who was it? Was it Thomas who chased down that uh, almost sure touchdown? It was on the kick? No, Tom just no. It was Justin Rogers. 
Justin Rogers. Number 25. Yeah, they're both number 25. That's why. Yeah, the defensive number 25. Yes, the defensive (laughs) number 25. Justin Rogers, uh, you want, he earned himself a roster spot right there. Uh, We need guys who can run down uh, on kick returns and punt returns, and that just locked it up for me. Yeah, absolutely. Robbie, what about you? Uh, I've got to give a shout out again to my boy Ty Naseki. I thought him and Ari Kwanjo both had a really good game last night. Um, when they were in, a lot of my, uh, Matt Jones's big runs came off of their side. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were pretty solid in the run game and pass pro. Um, I a lot of people hated on Emerson last night. I mean, obviously because that really bad play that to Steve the Smith, yeah. but. Yeah, but after that, I thought Emerson had a good game. He he had a near interception, mm-hmm. which turned out to be a nice pass breakup. Uh, later on during the game when uh, the Ravens were right there on the red zone trying to score after that mm-hmm. long kick return, they have tried to pick on him by throwing those two back-to-back fades. He answered really, really well, good you know, point. both incompletions. Yeah. Uh, I think Emerson uh, bounced back and had a good game after that. Um, I also think... Uh, the offensive line starters were not not good again in running game. Uh, we oh. kind of touched on it, but yeah. but um, Laval had back to back bad plays mm-hmm. at one point where he was driven right back into Alfred Morris as a big t- tackle for a loss, and then uh, there was a next play <clears throat> where he didn't give uh, Trent Williams enough support on a twist game and kind of left Trent uh, out to dry, which could have been a sack, but Kirk got the ball out of his hands quick enough to do that and i thought preston smith was really good last night too uh in all phases pretty much he was great in keeping contained on the front side he uh, was very smart on the back side didn't bite on the play action uh and obviously the sack was really good too so uh in that regard pretty good stuff overall here and there but uh person who had the worst night i thought was morgan moses we kind of touched on it too Mm -hmm. he just Completely, all the technique he's been playing with this preseason kind of went out the window. I think he got nervous going against a, a top guy like Elvis Dumerville and Terrell Suggs, and he kind of wet the bed. Um, yeah, that's not an easy was, task. I mean, you have to. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you got to. No, it's up. not. Exactly. Uh, when when Suggs and Dumerville were out, you saw a different Morgan Moses. He looked mm-hmm. better, and 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 that's the difference. I think he. His confidence was was not there against those two guys. I think he was intimidated and let his technique go away from that. So he needs to bounce back and have a better game because I still think he has Ty Naseki right behind him kind of looming in the corner that's consistently played well with good technique and, and very strong in the run game and pass game. So uh, I, I think, I, I mean, I don't think a change will happen, but I still think that he's been playing very well and can really push to be that guy. I mean, he made the switch to left tackle and still right. was very solid. So that's about it for me. Well, we got awesome. what, 75. Uh, the cut down to 75 is coming up soon, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, due to, with it's due Tuesday. Yeah. Cuts are due Tuesday. Yeah. We got to do our roster prediction pretty soon, right? Yep. Yeah. We yeah, will do a hard style roster prediction at uh, some point before the season starts. <laughs> yeah, and the season, yeah, it's it's just a couple weeks away here. Obviously, we've got to finish up the preseason next week against Jacksonville. Uh, probably won't be a terribly exciting game, but maybe some of this stuff will become a little bit clearer. So you will have to keep checking with us here on the Hogstye for all your game previews and recaps. We've also got another really, really cool exclusive interview coming up, but I won't sub- spoil the surprise, so you will just have to check back in. So uh, we will see you next time, and uh, keep checking us online at thehogstye.com on Twitter at the Hogsty, and we will see you then. Take care.